thanks Ellis for this new invitation. It's a pleasure being with you today. And this, this tonight's talk will be a conversation, an open conversation, a formal conversation uh, between myself, um, very interesting guests, um, Keller Easterling, who's going to join us shortly, who's an architect, a writer, and she's a professor at Yale, and she's written different books, um, uh, last to say, uh, which will always also be a forthcoming book is called Medium Design, investigating the relationship into, in between spatial and non-spatial possibilities. Um, and then the last book is Extra State Craft, The Power of Infrastructure Space, which was out in 2014. Um, Salomon Frausto is the Director of Studies of the Berlage Center for Architecture and Urban Design uh, in Delft at EU Delft, uh, with which I've been, I've had the pleasure of collaborating for a number of years. He's also the co-editor of uh, several works. His, his last research is about Theo Crosby. Um, it's an upcoming book, uh, I believe. Uh, Rafi Siegel um, is assistant professor of architecture and urbanism at the MIT, where he also directs um, a laboratory uh, called Future Collective and the program in urbanism, but he's also now a winning architect, having built from Mongolia to Israel, from Uganda to the States. Um, he's also um, curating exhibition, an upcoming one at, for the Venice uh, Biennale now in 2021, uh, and then um, <clears throat> and various others worldwide. Uh, so I'm very pleased to, to be in conversation with you all um, tonight. Um, and I may you leave interesting times, which was, as you may know, the title of the Venice Art Biennial in 2019, which was curated by Ralph Rugoff. And, and at this anticipatory uh, title. Um, and I'm speaking here, I'm, I'm upstate New York in Ithaca right now. Um, and at this time, there are significant crises that are um, shaking this country. Uh, so we do live at a very interesting pivotal um, time. And it's a time with geopolitical shifts and global unrest and civil unrest and increasing uncertainty and volatility, um, migrations, diasporas, climate crisis, uh, health crisis now, uh, but um, last but not least, very importantly, looming recessions, depressions, and inflations that are all colliding at the same time. Um, so these are interesting and menacing times, um, and it's a time where oversimplification of populism, fear, um, and importantly, a state of semi-permanent state of exception, to put it with the um, words of Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, or before him, the controversial political theorist Carl Schmitt. Um, this state of exception might prevail, and it's a state where, in which laws are suspended for an indefinite time, uh, but they're not abrogated. Um, and if the power of law is to distinguish in between political beings, citizens, from the bare bodies, as Zoe in Greek, um, recent events here in the States sadly show that this notion is too often overlooked. Um, another thing we're experiencing increasingly is a state in which all the tangible reality that is surrounding us is being invisibly organized by big data and big tech. Um, and this produced uh, simultaneously at the same time an, an impression of an endless flow of information, opportunity and possibility, which seems to be fully neutrally accessible, uh, but it also produces a state of potentially permanent surveillance. Um, like, you know, George Orwell's novel or even beyond. And then a borderless, borderless global environment of algorithms that are not fully regulated by laws yet. Um, and as I speak, I know that, for instance, in Spain, uh, um, every, every Spanish citizen uh, having a, um, a smartphone um, has now this COVID tra tracing app installed without any permission being asked for. Um, then there's the issue of uh, increasingly scarce resources from, you know, from the planet, from biosphere to the economy, um, possibly too extreme unbalance in the distribution of these resources. So, you know, this call for coordinated action that can only be global because those problems are global and too 
and it just the whole world. Um, but at the same time, we have this, this resurgence of new nationalism that is marketed in the promises, and we've seen it in you've seen it in Britain and, and, and in the US very recently, but that's where as well. Um, it's marketed on the promises of um, um, restoring societies to a past nostalgic pre-global sameness and uniformity. So it's sort of promise of paradise lost and the promise for a better life when hope is gone for, for too many people on this planet. Um, but the global model, as we know it, uh, is in need of reconsideration to prevent continuous meltdowns. Um, and the global virus thing, the ongoing pandemics, just exposes this, this crucial need that is access to nature, to landscape, to health, to housing, to decent housing, to civil rights, to shelter, safety. Um, what I would call the, with Aristotle, is the good life you seen, uh, which is meant as a political project. Uh, and then crises are a mean to examine and judge and discern. It's the Greek word, Greek name. So what if we examine it now, what is the good life now? So this is the first question I would like to ask our um, speakers tonight under the conditions that I've just um, you know, been talking about, but also urbanism and territorial strategies um, can evolve, may, may be able to evolve or not, and I'm asking you, to gain more relevance in a global uh, arena because it has lost relevance indeed over the last decades. Um, and then I would you know, talk about architectural education, you know, educators as well as writers and, and, um, and designers. Um, but then I would go on to practice as well and to ask how, how our discipline can not only like, provide a critical understanding of, of the situation we, we are now, but, but very importantly, um, new models of praxis, particularly importantly in this non-analog environment we are more and more in. Um, so that's my first question and now I leave you with it and whoever wants to start. Rafi. <laughs> Are we just about to say salmon? Uh, <laughs> um, Shotgun. Yes. All right. Um, it's uh, you know when when uh, we exchanged a few ideas, uh, kind of coming into this um, conversation, uh, it's really difficult uh, not to address uh, you know, the recent events where where we are. I'm I'm currently in Boston. Uh, so we've been uh, seeing what's happening more closely. And, and when you say, uh, you know, the good life is really, let's take a step back maybe and, uh, and say, who's, whose life are we talking about, right? It's kind of uh, in the context of uh, Aristo and the good life or the Greek polis of, of class division. Um, I say, you know, we need to unpack that for a minute and just talk about life or the right to live in our cities. Yes. Initially, uh, um, I, I've been working a lot on what, what I call collectives, on ideas of how uh, groups that are formed or new forms of, of publics uh, can self-organize and promote projects on their own, which kind of create their own support systems. I think in this context, I'd like to take a step back and in a way in response to Alessandra, what you, you're putting out here in terms of urban life or public space in general, and to, to reflect on how we've seen cities in, in the US or the space of cities in the US kind of define what we can maybe call emerging publics or new ideas of what what these publics are or are yet to be. And I think it's really interesting looking at this in context of maybe a reference point would be Occupy, which you saw 
people take over certain parks, right? Um, and kind of tent out in, in parks in, in New York and San Francisco. Here, I'm really interested, and i like I like for us maybe to start there about this kind of role of the street. Um, and it, you, we can't disconnect this from the situation of the street being vacant as a result of another crisis, right? And it's kind of available to be um, occupied in a way, or what we can call urban, the urban commoning, right? Turned into a common space, a, com a common space for a public, which I would say is, is really emerging through the act. So I think it's really fascinating and relevant to talk about that relation, about the spaces that cities provide in their ability to formulate publics and, and the relation and the kind of the symbiotic between the space of the city and the publics that are emerging by activating this, by, by, by claiming that space as public, as their own. And you're talking of a physical space still, but it's the space of streets and squares, public space. I think they're, they're, we are talking, yes, I think, I think that it's, um, it's both. Uh, the, what, it, what seems that the digital platform in itself or the digital space in this case is not, can only go a certain way. I mean, we can question that and we can ask, but seems that it, it adds on to eventually the action in physical space does something that the digital can only go so far, right? It's kind of the questions of relevancy of, of urban space again, as you know, at a, a time that we thought that we don't need it anymore. We're on Zoom and months. We've been used to having our public life, you know, through screens. Mm -hmm. And here we see how, how critical that physical space is, of course, to, uh, for protest, values, etc., but also to, I would say, to allow a new idea of public to emerge. I guess maybe, Rafik, I, I would like to know a little bit more about what these in your imagination, what these emerging publics are more specifically? So in the sense um, that are appropriating, um, let's say the typical spaces of the street or the square. Um, I mean, from this, and I ask that because from being here in, I'm sitting here in the fairy tale village of Delft, a remnant of the golden age, a sort of safe space. And um, of course, watching what is happening, uh, fixated on that. Um, and just sitting here and wondering, you know, is the street, is the square, um, I'm half torn in my mind. Are these spaces of um, uh, activation, appropriation of protest? Is this what we need right now? Or is it something, or is it something else? You know, how do we not fall into the um, uh, cliche, I, for lack of a better word, of um, this idea that the street is the space of protest or of action? Whereas, you know, I mean, what would happen if, uh, uh, so I'm just, you know, thinking here out loud uh, since this is a conversation. I mean, what would happen, you know, if we were actually um, uh, not buying on Amazon or not, you know, all these sorts of things, maybe that would be the kind of form of protest, right? So there's the kind of cliche, there's the cliche of what it means to go to the streets um, uh, versus what is then the effect, you know, are we just, um, you know, are we just feeding into a dominant system? I mean, what happened yesterday in Lafayette Square, you know, that, it, you know, um, that is a, um, uh, 
it gives uh, Trump, you know, uh, more uh, visibility, more control. It feeds into him instead of basic. And granted that that is, I know, a little bit different mm -hmm. than, going, you know, um, marching, being basically attacked. But I would be curious, you know, what are, um, how do we go beyond, um, yeah, the kind of cliches of public space, right? That's why, yeah. that's why I guess going back to my original point is what are then yeah. these emergent publics? Because then new demographics then require maybe new sort of spatial um, uh, uh, constraints, opportunities, figurations, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think it's a, a, a cliche in the sense that we're not we're not seeing. Um, let me let me backtrack for a second. I think when I talk about the kind of this kind of action or or activating the space, this is a process where perhaps the existing public space in the city had become too institutionalized or too controlled, and there is a need. Um, to claim a space, a way into a space that has not been designated, right? Like a square or like you know, a park or a gathering, but to claim or to take action and transform the space in the street as we see it now is not intended for protest or for gathering. It's a space for, for cars, you know, sidewalks on the side, et cetera. So I think there's, there's a difference here because going into the street and occupying the street and taking command of that space and claiming that space is a critical action in the formation of a public. Now, what do I mean when I say imagining these publics? I think these uh, events, um, you know, in response to, to, certain, to a certain situation in society, expose uh, a group. You know, maybe perhaps uh, people are saying, oh, we're actually surprised that there are not so many African-Americans uh, but actually a lot of white people here or what ages or are there Latinos, you know, in the context of the U.S., right? We're discovering uh, who is coming and then they're, they're saying, oh, there are actually some more radical groups kind of doing, doing all the kind of, uh, you know, the more violent acts and there are the peaceful groups. So through these actions, we're discovering who is standing behind uh, a certain value system or certain beliefs or certain common um, ideas through the action of being in that claiming that physical space, something that is very different than just you know being on the screen or or kind of keeping track in a digital platform of who buys what on Amazon or who like you bought whatever. Uh, so I think I think it's really telling for us as designers, as uh, people who deal with the city, is a kind of reminder how critical those spaces are and how important it is for the city to allow spaces that can be claimed. Mm -hmm. Kind of almost to say spaces that should not be, uh, uh, should not become over institutionalized or over controlled. Mm. But then we go back, thank you Rafi, we go back to the first, um, my first, um, question in a way, which is what is the difference in, in between bare life, which is and, and citizen, like a, a political being, a life with rights. Mm -hmm. and, and we are really seeing it, it's not just George Agamben, and it's not just the virus, because before the virus, it was like terrorism, emergency, especially in Europe, we've, we've seen, but in the US as well, we've seen this resurgence of like, a, laws being suspended, rights being suspended, rights being different for different kinds of people. We are like, yeah, we are like beyond architecture. But as you were talking, I was thinking of Paris, Osmanian urbanism that was meant to be um, a, a mean of control, mostly, to, to, to impede riots. So those linear axes mm -hmm. and the, the structure of the urban fabric was meant to um, control riots, but now we're shifting uh, to a new, I mean, we're shifting to a new era right now. We're shifting from mm -hmm. the industrial world to the digital world, to the computer era. This was predicted already in the 30s, and, and we've seen it already. You now, as Uber took over cars, uh, now automated 
cars. I think you've been working on, on automatic cars in the studio at the MIT. If I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. uh, they're taking over trucks and they're after labor. Um, and Netflix has taken over the traditional entertainment industry. Amazon has taken over the traditional retail forms, artificial intelligence will take over um, customer services, but even, you know, the services of architects and, and, and among many other professions. And, um, and then now, most importantly, even the Bitcoin cryptocurrencies will take over and blockchains will take over traditional transactions. Um, so all these are, you know, we're really at the moment of shift. And I think how can, and this shifting in between digital and analog and the fact that the analog world also as we know it is digital at the same time it is at the moment we will be using contactless payments the moment we will be using uh, automatic cars or whatever everything the digital world is even, even with the physical reality um, and this issue of the control is is it's pretty much there hello keller i'm glad you could join us so, um, you know, where, where we as architects, as urbanists, as educators can even direct new mm -hmm. generations in this. I will, I will I mean, sell on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe going back to this, I mean, I, um, because also just picking up on what Ravi said about let's say new institutions. I mean, I guess I'm very curious what this, um, I sent this question to our, um, well, to our guests here. Basically, you know, if the enlightenment, let's say created new types of public institutions or the public institution for the first time, and then a set of related spaces, including let's say the street, if we think of Hausman's parents, um, and some people may consider these institutions a thing of the past, the library, the museum, uh, the university can go on. Um, but then what are then the new kinds of institutions for uh, revised globalism? And how do we essentially design these both literally and metaphorically? What are the forms of representations? I mean, I, um, uh, yeah, you know, the kind of, um, you know, is, you know, what are public institutions? I mean, I know that there is a whole, um, uh, let's say we've all maybe spent our careers trying to break institutions, just I say this sort of provocatively to break sort of fixed things and fixed thinking. But now um, it appears more and more, um, at least to me over recent years that more than anything, we need institutions we need there's a on the one hand there's a desire for institutions and the symbolism and i mean that also both metaphorically and physically <laughs> um, um you know the as we see you know the institution of the presidency of the u.s presidency has been demolished but then the ins institutions of museums cultural things you know uh, right. Um, et cetera, have basically been vanished. So what now are these new kinds of institutions, um, public institutions that then will create new forms of uh, public space? So, I mean, I still think that that is, um, I think this is a kind of valid question. And if we see, you know, um, the name slips my mind, but there are these sociologists who the one, um, uh, two names that basically uh, uh, um, have developed, you know, Generation X, Generation Y, et cetera. And there's basically this thinking that there is a kind of, you know, there's always this kind of generational uh, kind of shift. And if we see it, basically it's the 18 to 25 year olds, you know, or early, or early, you know, that's, these are people craving, one could say institutions, I, per, you know, whatever that institution is. So that's why maybe I was going for earlier about that desire of what are those emerging publics that you were talking about, Rafi, going to the street. But then I would say, is that, you know, um, on the w one hand, um, how do we um, envision or imagine, uh, how do we get uh, students? I mean, I'm, what am I? I'm an educator. That's essentially what I am. You know, how do we, I'm thinking all the time, how do we get students to basically um, 
to think about what our new um, institute, well, how can they imagine new institutions and their physical and their physical forms, rather they're um, in the city or in the countryside. I mean, sorry, I don't want to turn this into a monologue, but I often think, you know, what is now the biggest in potentially institutional building out there is the data center, right? Which is also the most public, or sorry, the most private and the most highly secured. And I often wonder, you know, um, uh, uh, if we start to really look at that as a kind of design project, um, in its literal sense, how do we start to make something like this a kind of open and accessible and rethink those kinds of logics? You know, I'm, you know, I'm a pragmatist at the end of the day, so, you know, I need to have things concrete in my head. But the, um, yeah, so, I mean, and the basic thing is, you know, what are our new public institutions and what is our, um, what is our role as designers in that, you know? And I mean, I think, um, I don't know, I would say that's why I'm so interested in sort of Keller's work, especially on not only organizational space, but now medium design and how that, um, well, how that is, has a kind of duality to it, you know, uh, both as a, as a technique and as a, well, at least how I understand it, both as a technique or a set of techniques and a set of representations, which I think are two different things. But anyways, I shut up now. <laughs> Thank you. Keller, welcome. Um, very happy with you could join. We briefly introduced you and in your last and forthcoming essay as well. So we're very curious to hear what you can contribute to this conversation, in particular to also the you know, digital and analog and, and spatial and non-spatial, which is at the core of your book. Well, I don't, I, uh, Salman was just talking about the enlightenment um, uh, and institutions. And I suppose that, um, I think I understand what, what you're saying. Um, at the same time, I suppose the work that I'm doing is kind of um, maybe looking for another set of reliable forms, but uh, is not, is trying, very hard to kind of break a habit of mind that would that we would think of as enlightenment modern mind um the enlightenment modern mind that looks for solutions that looks for elementary particles that looks for a kind of certainty uh as the only mode of leading and so on um and instead looking at form, um, but for all the ways that form has been used to mean uh, everything from shape and outline to the marker of a concept, I'm kind of looking at forms squared or forms of forms or forms in an active register, not as a, not as a thing, but as a, an approach to the interplay between things. So it's a change in the habit of mind that's not looking for solutions, but looking for how for the orchestration of things. And while we've always been talking about ecologies of things uh, and interplay between things, I still think it's a culture that's under rehearsed in that, um, that still is in the grips of a modern mind. And you, you see it even now when we have digital technologies and we assume that it's the new digital technology that is the only way for to innovate for instance you know that if, 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 if there's no algorithm or blockchain or something like that then we're not we're not innovating so most of what I'm trying to talk about is an interplay that mixes different species of information heavy and digital um, you see it very well in this kind of COVID response. You can't use one species of data to look at it. Um, you can't look at case rates outside of race and inequality and access to healthcare and governance. And instead, the only way we can work on it is with a very simple protocol, a messy, lumpy protocol that has to do with distances with, with with medical information spatial information behavioral information 
but just, and yet it's simple and reliable. So it's those kinds of spatial protocols that I'm looking for and working on and finding it quite easy to work on them. But I, but I think it is a, it's still a form maybe that we all know about, we all use, but it still doesn't have quite the authority that other forms of solution making, you know, problem solving have in culture. Um, mm -hmm. That's enough. <laughs> I, uh, fascinating. Um, I wonder what, how you would describe the, where, where do these forms originate? or who, who in a way takes command or ownership or not ownership necessarily, but who promotes them. Is this, it's not a top-down kind of institutional, but there is a collective effort behind, behind this. Maybe we can talk a little bit about, because I'm coming at it from a point of view more and more that you know, also going back to Solomon's point on the, on the public institution, I think it's problematic to use the term public institution because it carries a certain baggage with it, yeah. We might need to come up with other terms. But I'm, I'm interested more and more in the idea that in order for a space to serve a public of some sort, let's keep that open, or a collective, some social restructuring is needed or some kind of social organization. The collective needs to exist or be formed in some space, not necessarily physical, it could be digital, in order for them to, to move on to, into the physical realm. I wonder how I mean, that relates color to what you described. I mean, I, I mean, I of course agree with this and I just wonder how, um, going back to maybe this idea of, um, yeah, I'm going to say this just to, for provocation. I mean, let's say modernism brought with it a value system that was, let's say, one could say clear, right? Okay. So now we're now outside. I mean, now there are multiple value systems that overlap and to have basically to fo have forms of collectivity or, co or different kinds of collectivity, there has to be, I would say, um, no matter how it aggregates, some let's say, value system for a set of values that basically things kind of um, aggregate together. So I, uh, I don't want to kind of sound neocon or something here, but I'm really trying to get at how do we then form these new kinds of collectives when there is a, so, such a, um, uh, on the one hand, we see that there's a desperation for, let's say, um, yeah, collectivity, for meaning, for, um, uh, yeah, sh something shared. Um, that then is basically being, um, but then on the other end of the spectrum, doesn't uh, there's a kind of lack of what we, what do we share? How do we share this? How do we become collective? You know, and so it's very easy to start to become collective by, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, going viral in uh, uh, social media and other things. You know, and that's one form of kind of. Um, sharing a value system but is that really sharing a value system it's one value system whereas maybe other people have other kinds of value systems so how do we bring this up or how do we, you know how do we wrestle with these kinds of questions you know and yeah putting um yeah that's you know, i mean how do we you know yeah where, where how do we find you know we yeah that's the desperation right now is, you know, what are our shared values and how do they change and how are there, you know, we share values, the four of us or the three of us, yeah, the four of us, we know each other. We have, we share a value system that allows us to operate together and be here tonight, but then we also are divergent in other, in other ways also in individuals. Yeah, well, I mean, Rafi, you were talking about the collectives, and then you're talking, and Solomon, you're talking about shared values, and so you're look you're looking for the institution that, or you're looking for some entity that would um, help to coalesce that work together, and so on. That that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, 
at the same time, how um, I wonder if the part of our collectivity, you know, exists already, but it does it doesn't come down to kind of one collective, or it's a it's a yeah. it's a, it's a set of, of, yeah. of different chain mm -hmm. of different um, things that are shared, um, yeah. and the the ease with that. Um, the space that is shared, the um, space itself as a kind of mixing chamber of all these different species mm -hmm. of information seems, um, it makes it for me in my mind that, that a potentially, you know, not only the, a relevance, but a, a form of survival for not only architects and designers, but for, but for a broader culture, um, you know, it's like we it, maybe it's good to talk about concrete examples, you know, uh, rather than in the abstract, you mm -hmm. know. But the 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 thing that now the the world shares that we will cover our mouth, that we will wash our hands, and we will stay six feet away. I mean, that's that's a simple protocol. Uh, it it's has to, it mixes all kinds of information, um, and we've agreed to to do it um, globally. You know? um, there's uh, the we've we've agreed on certain forms of uh, even globally across nations on on issues of climate and issues of um, of of social justice. Um, mm -hmm. um, or look at a specific example of uh, Hong Kong, where to to protest, you you must mix your physical body with a Bluetooth signal. You need you need both things, um, both digital and heavy. It's a and it's and the, and space is the mixing chamber for that. I just think there's mm -hmm. countless collectives, countless inter forms of interplay. Yeah. We share. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, well, the question, I think, I, I agree with you completely. Um, at some point, these protocols impact the way we shape space in the same way that using the existing space kind of also impacts back the protocol. This translation, space is not a passive, but it will also be reshaped in part based on these protocols. Right, so that, that translation, traditionally or not traditionally, but I kind of going back to the role of the designer here, isn't the role or is the role of the designer to help in that translation. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, it also requires a little bit of a different focal length for us too. I think probably if you, if you put, you know, three geometric objects in front of us and said, what do you mm -hmm. see? We would say we we would describe the geometric objects. We would if and if you put them, you know, if you let's say if you put them in strong light, um, we would describe the geometric objects. It's highly unlikely that we would describe the patterns of sunlight that are moving between them, or highly unlikely that that would be our first impulse, or highly unlikely that we would ask for more time to see some patterns in the light that's moving between. You know, like we would first describe the geometry. Um, right, so I right. think we would, be, we would yeah. better serve your collectives if we were able to see first interplay over objects. Yes. And I think in a way, object, when we talk about architecture, but if we talk about space, then we are seeing patterns before we see object by the nature of space, whether it's urban or even if it's interior architecture space. If we move the discussion, from objects to space, then we kind of, we need to be able to understand what defines, activates, occupies, what are the patterns that make up that space. So it's not an object oriented kind of approach, but, but it's a spatial one. So I think that, that is one way to kind of um, push for, to, to activate those lenses, right? That can inform the shaping of space. And this is directly the shaping of cities or the reshaping of cities. The, um, going back to this um, 
So we're living, I'm living here in the Netherlands in what has now been termed by the prime minister as the 1.5 meter society. And, um, you know, the Dutch are very good at branding things. Um, there is no respect of the 1.5 meter distancing. So, I mean, I have, uh, I see, uh, so this is for me very spatial. I do, you know, I need to get to tangible concrete things and I going back to a kind of collectivity. So there are a set of rules. The lockdown has been eased as of yesterday. Um, it's, uh, you know, but rules are still in place. The point being, I go into the grocery store. I keep my distance. People look at me as being strange and it's not just because I am strange. They're looking at me because I am strange by being courteous to make distance. I have a woman coughing on me uh, as she cuts across my 1.5 meter zone, you know, coffee, not cut, you know, not following the protocol that's being established. I see, you know, basically a younger generation because this is basically a university town, not follow, you know, beings, you know, thinking that everything is safe now that lockdown has been eased. And then an older generation, which is very scared, you know, there's a kind of, you know, uh, you see, you know, 85 year olds in the grocery store that are really keeping their distance. And this is just kind of one tangible example. So how do we form a collect? I mean, I, I, I want to really point on this is how, when, how do we do this when there is no, it's still, we are still, you know, in, in the century of the self, you know, to quote Adam Curtis uh, in this. So how do we start to, if something like just following a simple 1.5 meter and following the markings that have been placed on the floor, that's all that we need to do. You know, how do we put that into a kind of conscious imagination, you know, a consciousness into the public imagination is, yeah. I see what, I see your concern. I mean, and what I'm saying is not uh, to suggest that there's, you know, utter indeterminacy. No, 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 of course, but, no, of course, the, I know. The, you know the, we have institutions, we have technical languages, we have a legal language, a diplomatic language, um, scientific language, mathematical language, all, all these things. And those things are, are, have their durability in culture. Um, but I, what, I, what I'm suggesting is if, if there is something productive in a, in a kind of a design imagination, that's just good at cross-referencing those things, you know, that's just good at seeing a kind of periodic table of institutions and practices and being able to combine them in different ways that the, that the designing is the, is a combinant um, form that's, that, that's looking at the potentials between those durable institutions and making them um, function in different ways, you know, moving between risk and value and space and, and concocting something out of that that won't last, it, that's, that would mm -hmm. only be useful if it was temporary. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, the distancing, we're, we're feeling it all now, but I, I think it's, uh, it's more of a, a, a temporary condition. I think there are other um, events that the, the kind of the, the crisis will leverage that will have an impact on how we understand the city, how we understand open space, uh, how we value open space, how we in life in general understand uh, uh, the, the merging of the digital or the online with the physical. Uh, and more than ever, we understand that really the digital cannot kind of replace but actually it would find its place. It would have impacts on education. If we are talking about us as ed educators, you know, talk about the need to expand physical space. Maybe, you know, universities need to rethink that. And we could see a shrinkage in demand of space because we will be more in a hybrid mode with part online, part physical. I'm talking, you know, years to come. And maybe that also has an impact on how we understand the city. It kind of feels like we're gonna get out of this into everything one size smaller almost, you know, into a, a kind of our ability to value more and take better use of space in general and urban space. Not to talk about all the offices that, you know, are, would not be needed perhaps or needed less. 
So I think there are, there are so many things that will come out of this that will have an impact, not on the objects again, but through the patterns, through protocols, through experiences of virtual and physical space on how we understand the city. Mm. Yes, um, I'm thinking of it, Rafi, on something that you said um, previously about the, the open collective being uh, different from the transactional gig economy uh, because it contains this, this interrogation about who's making the decisions, who's receiving the access, the information, uh, the wealth, uh, and, and the power and the knowledge, how all these things are shared. Um, and I think that's quite a crucial point as uh, um, I was thinking of uh, this, this British economist, who, who Ronald Coase, who, who wrote a very influential seminar, let's say, in, in the 30s, in 37, if I'm not wrong. It was called The Nature of the Firm, uh, which was explaining um, how, you know, predicting almost, like, of having instead of business firms, um, just a multitude of independent self-employed people, like a platform of people who could contract one another. Um, and in a way, this is like a direction we're going and I'm, uh, I'm wondering how, you know, this, what this will mean for architect, for architectural services, for urban ser services and, you know, consulting services. Um, you know, this reorganization into is the firm, architectural firm, uh, going to an end in the next two decades. Um, or so based on these you know, shared platforms that are defining right now, they're already defining all, all realms of, 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 of the economy already with these this disruptions that we have, uh, again, from, from retail um, to, to tech and so on. So, so I'm, I'm wondering if in your um, um, activities as an educators, you're ad addressing um, these things with what, what is the practice of tomorrow like or the next 10 years or 20 years because obviously it's not the practice as we have known it i don't know if my uh, question is yeah, to i lost i lost your your last bit you were cut out in the okay in when the, was the i cut out board. No, I, I was wondering, what is the practice if you're addressing, we're all educators as well as other things, so if you're addressing yeah. um, vis-a-vis our students, like new models of prax praxis and practices for tomorrow, for yeah. the 10 years or 20 years, maybe 10 years is already far enough. At the moment, yeah. we're shifting, uh, as it was predicted by these economists in the 30s, we're shifting towards platforms of self-employed individuals uh, providing services. Right, right, right. right. One hour. I, you know, I it, can really, really briefly, yeah. yeah. Um, really briefly to answer that, I can give with a concrete example. We're primarily working in my research group with um, groups that have organized via, let's say, digital platforms uh, around issues of labor or market or economics, but which are geographically based or place based and looking if there is a spatial physical component that can strengthen that group to become a stronger support system for itself. So there is an arc behind it. The, the, the position is that there is an architectural project where the introduction of physical space mm -hmm. can strengthen a group uh, to become more um, resilient, more self-supportive, more self-reliant. For example, and, and there are concrete examples from projects in Colombia, projects in, in the U.S., uh, uh, projects in, in Israel, projects in, in uh, Rwanda. Uh, so. so in a way, it's a shift of the traditional model of the office or architecture company uh, as it was structured. Uh, towards... Yeah, I think, I think it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not a traditional shift necessarily in the role of the designer. It is, in a way, more of an organizational role for the designer, but um, yeah. But but the big shift is who the client is. This is what I see as the big kind of change. We talked about modernism, you know. Modernism for me now is where where a new client emerged called the state, and created with all these mass typologies, you know, hospitals, mass housing, uh, schools. You know, it's 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 a we had a new client, which is a state, 
public funds invested in, in creating a new set of architecture topologies, you know, the mm -hmm. private kind we had forever, really. But now, I mean, in the future, we're imagining a client, which is a group of people uh, which have a shared interest. It could be between six, 10, 17,000, whatever that group is, um, which seeks uh, a project or uh, is organized as a collective to promote a project. So I think that's a new kind of, of client that we as designers, we, client I say, yeah, um, in, in that sense that we as designers will be engaged with. I'll be really optimistic in, in, uh, in my response by saying that, you know, while, while we are meant to train students to do things with shapes and outlines and structures and gravity and, all, and so we should and so we will continue to do, um, that alone is an unsustainable thing now. There's no longer, you can't, you know, we, can, we can't in good faith say that that's going to sustain our students and it won't. Um, and right. instead their relevance can be found in something that might seem more ephemeral, but is actually more sturdy in its ability to see many, a wider array of opportunities in exactly as Rafi says, a different set of clients and constituents um, a, a different approach to form, form not as just shape and outline, but interplay. Um, a, of course, like a different business model, even a way of seeing site as something different. You know, you're not just going to a place and providing the master plan and dusting off your hands. You're providing a very, you're providing um, some uh, some set of potential relationships that unfold and change yeah. over time, and that's a different. It's a different form, mm -hmm. which I'm sure makes many people in our profession quite nervous. But in my view, it seems so much sturdier and more reliable um, in its indeterminacy. Ironically, or, or in its agility. Yeah, in its agility. Yeah, I mean that. Uh, I think agility and suppleness is a, is a is a good is a core key point. And I myself, as as an arch, as an urbanist, have been working in recent years using the word framework planning rather than master planning, for instance, like mm -hmm. all against this idea of like um, fixed and unchangeable, very rigid structure. Uh, because I think our discipline is so slow. And the world is going so fast right now that there's, there's this mm. big need for flexibility, for the ability to, to adapt, mm -hmm. to disrupt, to, to adapt very quickly. And I think it's something we should teach our students as well. The, um, no, I fully agree. I mean, there's also maybe to be the contrarian there's also the slowness of the process. So on the one hand, you know, there's, we have uh, the expansion, uh, constant, constant expansion, but then we also have uh, great compression also. So it's, you know, how do we basically negotiate both of those kinds of time frames? Whereas there is the, you know, we need to be fast, agile, nimble, but then at the same time, uh, uh, have the attention span to continue a kind of project and what and how a project can basically um, change or evolve over the course of time, and that's let's say that's realistic, right? And so that's why you know. So how do we? I mean, I think it's always an interesting challenge to basically teach students to basically deal with both sets of conditions simultaneously, and where there is a kind of real, where there is that place of action, which is somewhere in between, which is also in a way, you know, what Keller is also sort of. Um, you know, provoke, well, provoking or thinking about the, um, I, um, yeah. I mean, for me, I guess it's still, you know, we've only heard like, uh, there's the mention of the, a changing business model, but I guess in this sense, that's what the, um, that's the reality, right? So, you know, if globalization was one thing, you know, and now that has maybe reached its, um, peak and now we're it's what are then the effects of globalism right and so how do we kind of rebalance those kinds of uh, uh, shifts 
also, I mean, where, where is, what is going to, what's going to fund the business model? You know, what is going to fund a kind of project? I think, you know, I was thinking when Rafi was talking about these new collectivities, I mean, yeah, there's the kind of, let's say the bow group and model in, you know, you know, build, you know, buy your property together, build your housing, you know, there are other kinds of models. And I wonder, especially um, as the American living um, in the Netherlands, I just now from, you know, with a critical distance, I wonder in the U.S. what kinds of, uh, in a country that's based on the individual, <laughs> you know, going back to this collective, you know, how will there be these kinds of pra forms of practices or that, you know, we're kind of provoking when the whole ethos of well, yeah. a country or a mentality is based on, um, you know, the individual. So there is always, you know, we have to wrestle with that reality. You know, I mean, I, it's not that I. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't think they're contradictory. I mean, if you look back, also historically, mm -hmm. whenever a new idea of a community is formed, uh, it, it requires a new definition of what is the individual, right? And, and it's not that one, in order to be in a collective, or to you need to kind of let go of your individuality. You, the self needs to be redefined, but not necessarily being less individual. We have actually examples of socialist groups which were were highly individualized to the point that you know marriage didn't exist because each person was his own, right? Uh, or equal rights and, and, and equal responsibilities and equal uh, and and so forth. But that's kind of more theoretical, long longer term. I think there are um, going back to where we started, perhaps with with what we're seeing in the streets, there are more and more uh, groups, uh, also among young people, in, even in the US, or I would say in the US, that are looking for alternative um, models of living and are looking um, to form more of their self-reliant, in a way, support group and, and less to rely on government uh, or on state or on, on city, city government um, and, and are open to you know, ideas of less ownership, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. more commonality, uh, are looking for uh, a sense of community. So I, th I think that uh, this, and you know, I, I joke about it, it's probably easier to form a collective today in, in Brooklyn than, than in the kind of post-social estates. <laughs> so I, th I think that there are, there is an open, it's, it's completely from, from not, not the same, you know, but there are parallels to say that I think that actually uh, there is place for these alternative models in, in the US now. Yes, no, I, th I, I, I believe I agree with you. There is place indeed. It's what I feel as an outsider in, in the state, like a frequent visitor. In, in the state, but it, isn't it also to go back also to the first question, like the search for a better life or the good life or a better world? And I see, and I see there's a question from the public and we will uh, go soon to it, which is also about utopias as a way also to, 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 to aspire and access to a better form of, uh, um, of life. But isn't it in a way in, in the States right now also the loss of hope in a model as it is mm. this model? Has existed for the last hundred years or more, and, and, and suddenly there's a there's a loss of hope in, in this model of like a shared access to happiness and then you define happiness in not just as material abundance or in in, in many other way. Isn't isn't it also like a? Mm -hmm. in, I mean, maybe we. Ha I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. And so for my entire uh, childhood uh, and even early adulthood, uh, the city was always going to go bankrupt. Finally, the city went bankrupt and maybe that was the best thing for it, right? I mean, because there was, it was always sort of hanging on and maybe that's what I'm now starts to allow it. So, I mean, in this sense, uh, maybe hope comes from the most desire, you know, it, not to be nihilistic here, but you know, for me, that's I always use it as an example. That was the only way to kind of make a change when change could not happen in such a kind of contentious context that was basically reeling from, you know, uh, white flight and the riots of the '60s. You know, finally it needed. You know, there was so much money being poured in. You know, as a kid, we always went, you know, into the city center, supported, you know, the place, and then. 
but you know, it was always like dragging a dead horse. It finally had to go financially bankrupt in order to reemerge, you know? So in this sense, that's where the sort of, you know, maybe optimism can be found by needing to take things to their ultimate um, extreme for lack of a better thing. I, you know, mm -hmm. the, I, there's this question from about utopias. May I, may I, May I go to this? Well, did everybody see this question? I mean, I, I think would, I think we can give the micro, the virtual micro, to the public and and and. and Sarah, if you're there, I'll unmute you, and uh, you could maybe ask the question. Um. Yeah. Hi. 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 Conversation. Um. So I'm just going to read off the thing that I wrote because it's just so complex in my mind. Um, if it's not too off topic, can these ideas that you just discussed uh, in the con uh, can they be discussed in the context of utopian ideas? Uh, and I was specifically thinking about um, paper architecture of the 60s and the 70s. Uh, and also uh, the general trials and conceptions of utopia where people who feel um, that the system and the institution that they were in let them down as, and so they conceive a different system and an institution because as um, I think as Solomon said, the institution is something uh, people seek. Um, and within that a physical space, can that exist and let a person be content? Basically, that's the question if I were able to articulate myself. Well, I let my colleagues think that answer to the second part of your question. Maybe I can interject at the first part. I mean, the circulation of um, paper architecture of the 60s and 70s that has basically been dominating, let's say, the last 10 to 15 years in architectural education. I mean, I think the thing that I always find problematic in that is that basically all those projects that, you know, we can list 20 of them, I'm sure, very fast, are are basically proliferated as a set of images mm -hmm. and not basically discussed in terms of the uh, economic, social, political context in which they were developed. You know, so many projects were, you know, um, uh, already kind of proto post-industrial or, you know, things developed out of, you know, the, the uh, uh, bankruptcy of New York City and lack of work. Uh, you know, so there were, uh, at a certain moment, you know, so these, these projects kind of evolve um, with very, there's a certain kind of specificity to the context and the moment in which they're created. And now they're basically, um, that's, you know, idealized as a kind of utopian, because we're such a kind of image-based uh, society, these images have been basically appropriated and proliferated and, you know, um, regurgitated, rebooted. And I think it's just really important to always remember whatever kind of precedent, rather it's uh, 14th century or 21st century, to always place things within their kind of social, political, economic context. I mean, I just keep sitting here thinking how, um, uh, you know, each context is very different. Each, um, you know, this whole issue of locality, um, you know, I mean, you know, back in the day, 20 years ago, we were talking about the local, the global local, you know, the kind of, but this, there are certain, there's specific contexts, and we can call that, let's say, uh, as a synonym, the local. And I think we just all need to be very much aware that we talk in sort of specific terms about general conditions. And maybe what globalism or globalization has done is it's basically brought out a general set of concerns and questions that are uh, unprecedented at a kind of worldwide scale, but that each, um, you know, we're in our own particular context and we need to start being relational uh, to that. I mean, that not, you know, what you're feeling in your place, I guess you're in London, I don't know, uh, is maybe- well, I'm actually in Istanbul, I'm from okay, Turkey. Okay, so you're in Istanbul. Like, really. <laughs> this, is, this is a great example. So there's not a kind of, you know, there's not a kind of genericness. So there are maybe mm -hmm. general concerns, but everything always has a kind of specificity or context, you know? And I mean, and I know I'm using all bad words here, but I'm doing oh, that, okay. <laughs> I, antiquated terms, but I'm sort of doing that actually on purpose to counter, um, other kind, you know, well, to, to basically, uh, yeah, yeah. 
So now, sorry. I don't want to disappoint, but, but <laughs> I, I don't want utopia. Um, and I don't, I'm not looking for it. And the search for it um, in contemporary or historical culture, while it, it has represented a progressive spirit, I want that progressive spirit, but I look to the side of the utopia because the utopia is part in my mind of that kind of in modern enlightenment mind trap, you know, that, that it, that ends us, that keeps us in a kind of mono ideation hole kind of, yeah. or ideational monotheism of some kind keeps us back in a monoculture or you know keeps us in a kind of enlightenment loop or worse in a yeah. in a binary that's against a fight between utopias you know for for dominance um so that that just that the search for that the you know the idea that you know when you have something emergent that that must be radical that that it must have a manifesto all those habits are are really tragic sort of sad traps in in my view but i mean i guess but that's i mean i completely agree on this i mean and i what i wonder really is then how do we um those those models or the proliferation not only of these images but it's also a sign for me of a kind of sign of the need for hope, right? Or a kind of going back to this issue of value system. So, you know, so it's seen, you know, how these things are packaged and talked about is uh, it's it, uh, without all the, all the context is seen as, you know, hopeful and um, having a value system that one can, you know, contribute to, you know, see from if you're, you know, against, you know, consumption, then all of a sudden, ah, you can go, you know, to Super Studio and they were against consumption. Uh, uh, to you know all these kinds of things so it's how do we basically um, uh, yeah I mean there are maybe other way, things to look at to be hopeful about and to find possibility in and to not limit oneself I mean just to I you think. mentioned Detroit um, I mean it's interesting and, and I, I a little bit of text that I circulated among my colleagues had to do with not looking for solutions, but embracing problems, or not 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 eliminating problems, but just putting problems together to leaven and catalyze each other. That that and in many ways, a place like Detroit is the value. You know, negative one and positive one are both the same distance from zero, and they have the same. They can have the same potential. All those things which our properties that fell off of the financial ledger still have value, still have um, potential, and maybe sometimes even more potential, more potential once they're free of being a trafficked mortgage product or something like that. You know, there's, it's not the, it's, it's the problem is not the problem. It's the, it's, it's the segregation of those problems. Then, in, into another one of these monocultures or um. maybe I just see Rafi's uh, uh, response about the city and well going back to this thing I think it's uh, you know the city as a place to live work gather entertain but not necessarily the same typologies of office buildings as we know them I mean I think what this is already reminding me of well is you know Maybe that to tie things together, that's also the failure of modernism or the four functions, right? What was it? Work, dwelling, uh, uh, recreation, roads or infrastructure. You know, the one thing that was missing in that kind of idea was commerce, you know? So, that, you know, or there was no kind of um, engagement with, let's say, capital um, uh, or let's say money in that sort of sense. So, you know, in, in that sense, it's sort of funny that we go back that these are still the constituent parts of maybe what make up a good life uh, uh, is, you know, the kind of intertwining of this, you know, because 
what's being implicit here is that the good life is found in the city. I mean, that's what's been basically implicit in our discussions yeah. um, uh, in the conversation this evening is that the city is um, uh, maybe the site of the good life. But I think it's interesting to uh, yeah. think mean, about how those things uh, evolve. 